All right. Okay. So let's uh, get things started for the lecture portion of our class. Your favorite, of course, right? Uh, so we talked last week about interviewing. And we spent a fair amount of time talking about interviewing. You guys have spent a fair amount of time interviewing, right? And most of that's been uh, the diff five different interviews that you've done have been these informational interviews. Uh, but some have already started doing their mock interviews, right? And, and many of you have them scheduled as well. And a job interview is different. And we talked about this just a little bit last week. We talked about uh, what the job interview might look like, might feel like, what different ways you can approach that, how you present yourself, what questions you ask. And I've got to tell you that there are a number of resources, and I, and I say this almost every session that we have together, that the Career Center has tons and tons and tons of resources for you guys when it comes to doing a job interview. Uh, different questions you can ask, uh, the way you might dress, uh, things like we talked about showing up early, you know, just all this sorts of stuff. We didn't really talk that much last week, and we're not going to cover it much in this class, but I really want to encourage you to do this. And that is that while you're sitting in the interview, um, what are the questions that you can ask? We talked about that STAR method last week. Um, but also, when you get specifically to that part about salary, and somebody might ask you, well, what kind of salary are you expecting uh, to earn at this job? Are you supposed to answer that question in a job interview? The answer is no. You're, you're supposed to resist answering that question in a job interview. What, what, what are you supposed to be doing? Some your inter, your interview. So you get you have a you submit an application. You get a phone call. You do a Zoom interview. Now you're on the second or third interview in person, and you're sitting down. And during the course of that interview, they ask you, um, "Well, what are you expecting to make uh, working this job?" Right? Are, are you what are you supposed to do in that situation? Let's ask for the written offer. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to, how would you go? Uh, I'd like to ask for a written offer. Like, no, I mean, you, it's just like you said, not exactly, but that's what you're supposed to do, right? But you got to figure out how you're going to do that, right? I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying. That's right? what you need. Right. That's what you need. That's what you need, right? So you got to figure out kind of how to deflect that question, right? And expect that question. And it, it comes into negotiating. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about negotiating. Negotiating you know, a job offer, right? And um, because when you're right in that situation, well, here in the state of California, it's actually illegal for job postings to not have a salary or a salary range. So actually that's gonna, for most of you in the state of California, if you're looking for a job in California, you should be able to identify what's the salary range for that offering, even as you apply for the job. Also, you should be aware that employers are not allowed to be asking you about what you got paid in your last job, right? Oh, what were you making at your last job? What are you making at your current job? What were you making at your last three jobs, right? Why would an employer ask that question? They're negotiating, right? That's what they're doing. They're negotiating already. They wanna know how much they need it. If, if they were thinking of paying you double what you're getting paid now, and they find out that that would be a double for you, they might go, oh, you know, this person's here. It seems like they want the job. Do I really need to double their salary? Right? So you would be giving them leverage by sharing that with them. Is that true? So in California, that's actually illegal now. Right? Uh, so just be aware. If somebody were to begin to ask you those sorts of questions, maybe telling them it's illegal might not be the best way to go about it. Right? Um, but, uh, you know, you pick up your phone, you start dialing, they're like, what are you doing? I'm reporting you right now, you know? uh, right? But to be aware and then to work through how to deflect, right? How to navigate around that, how to, how to have a positive outcome on the outside of that, right? I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. I'm going to tell you, there's tons of resources on how to do that. Go search them out. What we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about what to do once you get the job offer, okay? We're gonna talk about what to do once you get the job offer. But before you get the job offer, deflect the, hey, what salary do you want to get paid while you're while you're doing the interview? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, so not just for salary and negotiating that, but all negotiating. Yeah. You know, one of the most common tactics is you get the other person to say their number first. Totally. Just because of the reasons you said. Yeah. Not just salary. 
So not just salaries, it could be other benefits. It could be, you know, um, are you willing to work remotely? Are you so it's okay to answer some of these questions, but be aware of what you're giving away as you as you speak. If you're not going to respond at all, that's not going to go well. The interview's not, you're not going to end up with a job offer, right? But you want to practice. That's why role playing. That's why I mentioned earlier today. I hate role playing, right? Practicing is no fun a lot of times, right? There's nothing like the real thing, but the stakes are too high when you're doing the real thing. That's why you practice, right? Because you want to get to that job offer. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, actually, we're going to talk a lot about um, uh, negotiating. So post job offer, right? You want to, um, you've got the offer, you've done the interview. Uh, you want to highlight that you're in enthusiastic. You want to get an offer in writing. So that can come via email. That's okay. Uh, but you want to get that offer in writing. You don't want to say, oh, I, I thought you said that I was going to get paid this much and I had this many days off and we had this many holidays. And you don't want to think they said anything. You want to get it in writing. Does that make sense? So, you know, this might seem rudimentary, but again, just make sure you've got this. Um, ask people. Once you get a job offer, you might share that with the people that you trust and that you know. Um, people that have experience in, in, in the space. You're surrounded by those people in this program, right? People that can give you some advice about that job offer, okay? Um, communicate as needed with other potential employers. So if you're not just interviewing for one job, but you've interviewed for multiple jobs, you want to appropriately communicate to others. That could be very important because you end up deciding to take a job with a company and one year, two years, three years later, go back and take a job at one of the other companies that you interviewed with before, right? So it's still appropriate to write them a thank you note or to follow up with them or let them know that you took another position, right? Do you have to do that? You don't have to, but that'd be a good thing to do, right? For, for just future um, relationship, networking, stuff that we talk about a lot in here. Uh, negotiate only if you want the job, right? So this isn't a job you actually want, then let them know. Right, that, that's, that's fair, right? That's fair to do that. Um, employers, a lot of times waiting on you just as much as you're waiting on them, right? So they might have other applicants that they wanna move on to, but they need to hear back from you and negotiate it only on the job you want. So a little bit about negotiation. Um, you know, one of the questions was, if you guys have any experience uh, with this stuff, and I'd love to hear if you guys have had, had to negotiate specifically uh, when you when you when you apply to go work at the movie theater, are you negotiating your salary? Usually not, right? And that's okay. But some of you have maybe been in positions where you've negotiated uh, one way or the other. Can anybody share some experiences there, James? Um, yeah, I had an internship over summer at an accounting firm, and they gave me a full time offer uh, when I graduated, but I I declined it, and um, I actually asked to instead. Um, come back next uh, summer as another intern for a different role. Like I wanted to do audit okay. instead of uh, tax. And, and they said that was fine. And they said the offer you know, is still there if I want it. But since that's not really what I wanted to do, um, yeah. but I still wanted to have like a relationship with these people in the company. They were totally fine with that. I just told them like, hey, you know, this is really early in my schooling. I, I want to try some other roles out. Is that okay? We can postpone the offer later. Right. You were cool with it. And you knew what you wanted. So that made responding probably easier, yeah. right? You knew it, whether that is or isn't what you want. Anybody else had any experience with with negotiating a job offer? I didn't negotiate my current pay for my job right now. I don't I don't know how helpful this is going to be, but I'll share it anyways. But I knew the person that was interviewing me and we were negotiating about this, I knew they were going to take that number and run it to the owner and get approval for them. So when I was communicating with them, I made sure like the words and everything I used they could retain that and bring it to the owner and everything yeah. like that. Like I was really cognizant that like that wasn't the final say. But I had okay. That was like an end negotiation. Good pro tip. Know who you're negotiating with actually, right? Is are you is it the, is this the decision maker or is there somebody else making a decision? And I really like what you said about communicating then appropriately. Because if you're telling all these stories and you're giving all these details, it's never going to make it, right? Yeah. To the person that's making the decision. So understanding that. That's a great tip. Okay. Um, I negotiate my pay every time I get hired, right? Which, so it's like, gosh, you know, I don't go to one job interview. I go to multiple job interviews, like every month, every year, right? And I'm always having to negotiate 
And so I've I've taken a number of courses. I've spent thousands of dollars getting trained. I got all these little, you know, I'm a certified negotiation expert, you know, um, <laughs> by, you know, different people have given me certifications from classes I've taken, all this sort of stuff, right? Not to mention all the books and all that sort of stuff I've read. And I mean, if you wanted to take a three-day class at Harvard on negotiation, it would cost you about six or $8,000, you know, to go over there and sit in an in-person class for, for two days, you know, maybe three days. It's a highly studied, it's a, it, it is a, a highly uh, monetized thing, negotiating. And people negotiate all kinds of things, right? Um, people negotiate hostage releases, right? Which is way on one end of the spectrum, right? Uh, there's a guy, uh, an FBI hostage negotiator that wrote a book called Never Split the Difference. Because when you're negotiating for people's lives, you don't split the difference, right? And a really intriguing book. I recognize, I uh, recommend it. I think the guy's last name is Voss. I always forget his first name. But um, really cool book, Audible. It's, he's got this great, awesome voice. So it's fun to listen to. But then there's also just negotiating with, you know, your four-year-old about whether or not they're going to go to bed without another drink of water, right? And you're negotiating, right? And interestingly, there are some things, some tips and tactics and tricks that work on us humans um, in, in some ways universally. And so if that's something that interests you, right, uh, we don't have time in the next few minutes to, to even, you know, touch the tip of the iceberg, honestly. But negotiation is a, is a huge topic. And I, I recommend you get at least somewhat familiar with the, the, the tenets of negotiation, right? One of the first is recognizing when you are in a negotiation, right? When you're in one. So when I have a house for sale as a realtor, there's a home, there's some amazing photos up, I've got a price listed, and I have instructions on the internet as to what a realtor is supposed to do to contact me if they want to show that home to their buyer. Right, you guys with me? And here's what I get. I get a text message, right? And the instructions are, please text me your name, your company name and your license number with the time and date that you would like to show this property, right? And then I'll, 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 I'll get it arranged. And here's what will happen. I'll get a text, right? I'll get a text at 11.47 PM, right? The text shows up and it's like, can I show your home on Main Street tomorrow? You know, the even worse is, can I show your listing tomorrow? Okay, right. Which one? Which house did you want to see? Who are you? Is this a realtor? What you know? What time tomorrow? It's eleven forty-seven p.m. Right? Guess what's happened already? Negotiating has begun. Right? I. This is not the kind of professional that is going to stand a chance with me. You see what I'm saying? Right? Negotiating has begun, and I recognize that negotiating has begun already. But the person on the other side doesn't recognize that. You see what I'm saying? So that's one key thing is understanding when negotiating has begun. Does that make sense? And guys, it's begun when you submit that application. And that's why you want to be careful about how you submit that application. Your first interview, your second interview, how you dress, how you talk, how you present, how you follow up. These are all parts of the negotiation. Today, we're just going to talk about after you've had an offer, right? But I want you to be, be aware of some of this stuff. So. Um, stay positive, maintain relationship. Long-term relationships require a different negotiation approach than short-term relationships. So I would recommend for you to treat most of your relationships like they're longer term. Does that make sense? If you're interviewing with multiple people, treat it like a longer term relationship. I sat down next to a guy at a networking event this morning because I'm always doing that. I sat down next to him. He started talking. He says, yeah, my name's Mark Crosby. And I go, oh, Mark Crosby. And he goes, yeah, this and that. We're tr I'm trying to start this business. And I go, yeah, my father-in-law used to bring his car to your shop like 30 years ago. He goes, oh, yeah, what's your father-in-law's name? I go, oh, this guy, he goes, oh, what's his wife's name? I tell him, he goes, he goes, oh, yeah, I remember him. He drove a Mercedes. I go, yeah. I mean, that's long-term, right? And hopefully I've never done anything disparaging or inappropriate or that I would regret or around this guy at some other time because there's a long history of relationship, even though we didn't know it. And so treat all of your relationships, if you can, somewhat like a longer term relationship when you're looking for a job. Keep your emotions in check, do comparative research. We'll talk more about each of these things. Know what salary you could reasonably expect. I'm going over things fast because we're going to get into more detail in a minute. Don't go first. I already mentioned this. So 
Don't be the one to make the offer, right? Uh, ask for the offer. There's a bunch of tips on how to do this. I'm not giving them to you today. Go find those on your own. The Career Center's got a bunch of those. Um, you could ask for a salary range. That's fine. Ask questions. Use active listening. Take your time. Be creative. You can negotiate other issues besides salary. These are all things we're going to talk about in more detail. Um, and learn how to justify any counteroffer you might make, right? So pre-interview, even though I said we're only going to talk about post-offer, I do want to tell you this. Negotiation is about preparation, okay? So be prepared in order to negotiate well, right? How well is the fighter in the ring that's prepared going to fare against the one that's unprepared, right? Always the, the better prepared is more likely going to do better. That's what's kind of happening. Um, so know your needs and wants, right? Uh, one of my kids, I told you, just got hired by the city of San Marcos, right? And if I were to ask her, so well, what do you need? What do you want? She's like, well, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I need a job, right? It's like, okay, but like, what do you want out of the job, you know? And listen, if you ever are in that space where you're having a hard time identifying whether or not it matters, take an extreme. So, well, what if you work 60 hours a week and you got paid a hundred bucks a week? With that, well, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, okay. So you do have, you do have boundaries, right? Okay. Well, let's talk about it. Because sometimes we have a hard time getting there, thinking about that. But know your needs and wants. I would recommend you write those down. What are the things that you that you want? Make a budget. How much money do you need to make? Make a budget, right? Um, that's not the only thing that might be the deciding factor, but you need to at least start there. You need to know your target salary. You need to know what kind of schedule is okay with you. Like she gets to, she gets every other Friday off, right? That's kind of cool, you know, but just to be at work 7.30 all the other mornings and work till 5.30. So she's working longer days the other, the other day. So just to figure out if that's going to work for her, right? Uh, what benefits there might be. I'll get into a whole bunch of those in, in a little bit later. Uh, what's the work environment that you want to have? What are the benefits that you want to have? Um, and what opportunity for advancement, how important is that for you? Okay. So you need to identify what you want and what you need. And just before you get to that person-to-person -person interview or before you get the offer, really, you want to have this very clear, okay? And some of you don't. You don't know the answers to these questions. You haven't thought about it very much. You need to spend some time thinking about it, right? You need to spend some time thinking about it. You need to know, uh, know your value. Um, you need to spend some time looking at the market, right? <laughs> Uh, if you have a degree and you're in San Diego and you've interned for two summers with another firm, well, what, what should you expect to make, right? Besides what your budget is, what does the market say you should make? How can we find some of that out? You guys have already been doing some of this, but how do you find that out? Glassdoor, right? Any other ideas? informational interviews, right? Fantastic way to find out what you should be making. Yep. Again, here in California, a lot of times this stuff is going to be posted. So you could go peruse other job listings, right? You could talk to other people. Can friends and family help with this stuff? For sure, right? Um, just talking to people, finding out what you should make. I would do this before. I would do this before, right? So that you know, you, you know what you should expect. Again, I'll, I'll go back to my daughter. She got a job. She got an offer, right? That offer was getting paid quite a bit more than either of her two older sisters, okay? If she used that as the measure, then she'd be like, I got a great job offer, right? But is that the right measure, right? Because one of her sisters is a social worker who they work for like free, Right. Uh, I mean, I'm not, but she doesn't get paid very much in a lot of the jobs that she's had. Right. And then my other kid's a teacher who honestly doesn't get paid that great either. You know, a uh, first year middle school teacher. Right. Doesn't really get paid a lot. of. I mean, I mean, they, they both have jobs and they can get by it. That's fine. But with a civil engineering degree, you know, in San Diego, what could she expect to get paid? Should she use that as her measure? No, she she's other things as her measure, right? So do this first. Yeah, Dave. All those things under knowing your needs and wants are important. I think it's also important to rank in your mind which ones are the most important for you. 100%. Uh, 
Okay. Negotiation is not just salary. There's many facets. And so you can give something up that you don't really care about to get something that you really want. Exactly. So if your goal is to live in some other part of the country, that might be the priority, not salary, right? Having said that, does it cost a lot less to live in some other parts of the country? Yeah. So it's all relative. And yes, you want to take some time going through all of this and understanding this really well and prioritizing these things. Also understand your unique value proposition. Think about that. Talk about that. What's unique about you? What can you bring to a job that you're interviewing for? Right? What's special that you know, uh, or even that you think you know, right? So, so, so work on that. So this is uh, as you're preparing, right? Um, uh, what your value is to an employer, uh, what your job or position fit might be. These are just things that you're assessing your value, your contribution, right? And also what you want. Does that make sense? Okay. So learn how to get through that, right? And then you need to spend some time thinking about, well, what about them? What do they need? Right? That's, you need to consider your, and they're not an opponent necessarily, but kind of for our conversation, they sort of are, right? Know your opponent, right? Know what they need, know their strengths, their weaknesses, their desires, what they've got going on, what the employer needs and wants. Uh, why are they hiring? Who are they seeking? How long have they been searching? Right? Does that make sense? If you know somebody's had a job posting, trying to fill a position, for the last eight months and they've been unsuccessful and now they're calling you in for an interview, do you have some leverage there? Yeah, so these, this is good information to, to go understand, right? What kind of person are they seeking? And then why are they hiring? Is that a good question to ask somebody? Why, why are you hiring? Can you tell me more about this position? Is this the first person that's had this position or has somebody had it before, you know, me, right? These are good things to ask about. Um, so just, Get that down, right? Okay, we're just preparing. We're preparing for a negotiation because it's about preparation. But then negotiation is all about follow through. I want to make sure that you guys know this. Again, I said we were only going to talk about post offer, but here I am talking about all this stuff before you even get an offer. Uh, you need to restate your interest in the position with an email or a phone call within 24 hours, right? After you do an interview, make sure you do that. We talked about this last week. Add or discuss anything you may have left out. Send a handwritten note. You guys grabbed notes last week, right? Put those to work. If you interview at four different places and one makes you an offer, send a thank you note to everybody. Okay, guys? Be a professional. Be somebody they would want to hire, even if you got hired by somebody else. Does that make sense? So so do that. Tim, were you, you going to say something? Yeah, I do. No, nope. um, go ahead. Yeah, I would, for the post-interview follow-up, do you want to speak with the person that hired you or do you want to speak with HR? Because I've been in that scenario before where I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to speak with HR. And I'm like, I wish I was speaking so with the interviewer. Yeah. Just take what you can get. Yeah. If you've got the interviewer's contact information, you know, I would I would try to reach out to them. You know, thank them for the interview. I'm interested in, you know, I'm interested in the position. I look forward to receiving your offer. You know, something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but some companies have different corporate structure that may not allow you to do that. So just be aware. Follow their protocols as appropriate. But it's probably okay to push, you know. It's probably, yeah, that's what I did. yeah, push a little bit, show some initiative. Um, but yeah, definitely sending a handwritten note is great. So negotiation about follow through and then about strategy. So you want to consider all the features and benefits of an offer. And here's all the things that uh, we were, you know, I know sometimes putting all this stuff on the screen at once means that you guys read this instead of listen to me, but that's okay. Salary isn't the only thing, right? There's a ton of things besides salary, right? That may come into play when you get an offer. So when someone makes an offer to you, uh, take your time to understand all of these different things. And I'll upload this slide so that you've got this. In fact, I've got a worksheet that I just put up on Canvas for today's class that you guys can download. It has all of this on there, on a worksheet that you can print out and, and actually work on, right? So I put this together for you. But man, is this a job you can get and they'll, they'll reimburse your tuition while you'll get a master's degree, okay? Would it be worth taking that job at maybe $5,000 a year less, right, than another position? Could be, you know, that, that could be maybe worth it. Does that make sense, right? Medical benefits, can you work remotely if you want to? What's your vacation time look like? Are there career development opportunities? Are there professional development opportunities? Those are different things. Is there room for upward mobility? Is there an expense account? 
right? All, all of these different types of things that can come into play when you're negotiating. You need to be aware of them or you're going to fail or you're you're going to fail to maximize your negotiation potential. Does that make sense? If you don't if you didn't know what your benefits are, you go there well, and I and I and I demand this. And like, well, uh, that's part of the package we offer. You. Oh, oh, okay. That doesn't look very good, right? So you need to be real familiar with this stuff. Does this make sense? And then um, I want to say that you can identify a couple more things. So again, I, I've got a worksheet that you guys can, can get all this stuff and, and work on this yourself. You've got the job offer in hand now, right? You've looked it over really carefully. You understand what you're being offered. Um, you need to identify what it is you would like to have and what it is you, you have to have, right? What is it that you must have? Like I, like, I have to have weekends off, right? Because I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I can't work on weekends, okay? Let's say that's a possibility. And what if the offer includes that you need to work Saturdays, right? You get Mondays off, but you need to work Saturdays. Well, what are you gonna do about that, right? How are you gonna negotiate that? Is that a make or break deal, right? What are your other opportunities? So you need to know what you would like to have, you need to know what you must have, and we're going to talk about this thing called BATNA. Anybody ever heard of that before? Okay, we'll talk about that in just a second. Understand the style of the person you're negotiating with. Some people don't want to play games. Some people love to play games, right? Who is it that you're negotiating with? Who is your interviewer? Who is the decision maker? To mention the, you know, knowing that he's talking to somebody, but that the owner was going to make the decision. Okay, well, understand it. If you knew anything about the owner, maybe you would know what would be the best information to get to them, right? Does that make sense? So know who you're negotiating with. Understand what the time frame for the decision is. If you get an offer, you might ask, how long do I have to respond to this offer, right? Is it 24 hours? Is it two weeks? You know, what is it? When do they? When is the position planning to start? And then understanding your, your employer's bat enough. So uh, I'll write this on the board because I didn't actually put it on our slides, but this is called... Uh, BATNA is works better with the marker that works. B A T N A is your best alternative uh, to a negotiated agreement. Okay, so what that means, because you can't really read my writing anyway, um, what that means is if you come to an impasse, if you can't negotiate an agreement, if this job doesn't work for you, what's your next best alternative? What are you going to do instead? What are the other options, right? Now, if you're interviewing for two, three positions and they've all made job offers, is this a little bit easier to, to, to do, this concept anyway, is it? Yeah, a little bit easier concept, right? Um, what if the first job you interview for, they come back to you the night after your interview and they make you an offer, but you have two other interviews set up for later this week? What do you do? Some of, some of us, some of you, some of us, we, we go, yes, take the job, right? I'm going to sleep good tonight. Forget those other guys. You know, don't even call them and tell them I'm not interviewing with them. They show up to your interview. You ghost them, right? I mean, like that could happen. Could that happen? You know, you're excited, right? You got a job offer. But that's not going through this process that we just talked about, right? You where you want to negotiate the best that you can. And the, and the way to do that is to go through this process of understanding what is the best alternative to, to coming to an agreement to come into an arrangement. What would be the best alternative? And you really need to think think about that. And you really need to understand, uh, understand that. I'm gonna talk more in depth about this in the next slide, but I do wanna mention, these are all things you wanna spend some time thinking about. And then you wanna think about uh, your, your employer. How will you benefit the employer specifically? How do you fit? Yeah, Dave. When you say time frame for decision, my mind first goes to what's the employer's time frame. That's right. But you also 
would be considering your time yep. frame, especially if you're doubling, you know, you have an offer, but you have another job. Like yeah. I had, had a conversation with a student just today. They had an offer, they had another job that they kind of wanted more, but they didn't have an offer yet. So yeah. I want to tell them what your time frame is well. 100 percent Yeah, because you have a life, right? I've got plans, it's the holidays, I, I can get back to you at the beginning of December, right? But some employers, that's, this is a too highly coveted position. I'm not waiting until the 1st of December, forget that. So you can ask, you know, but you need to understand a time frame for both the employer and for you. If you've never thought about this before you're in that situation, this is gonna be a little bit more stress, right? There's not gonna be as much confidence moving through it. So I wanted to deliver this to you guys so that you can have this in front of you and really spend some time thinking about going, going through this. Now, I want to go through this BATNA thing really quick because this is useful for any kind of negotiating, frankly. And what, what BATNA is, it's a four-step process where, first of all, you list your alternatives. So you've got a job offer. The job offer is that you're going to get paid $80,000, right? It's a salaried position. Um, you are going to work 40 hours a week. Uh, you do clock in or keep track of your hours. Pretty good benefits. You got some medical benefits. You got paid time off. Um, you have holidays. And you get to accrue some vacation time uh, starting at the end of your first year, let's say. Right? But um, it's in Fresno, okay, which no, nothing against Fresno. It's close to Yosemite. You know, you get to visit some cool places. But it's not San Diego. Right? It's in Fresno, Okay. And um, they need you to start uh, on January 1st. And right now it's, it's November, right? Which, which may be fine too. So you, if you had an offer like that, you want to think, well, what are my alternatives, right? What are my options if I don't, if I don't take this job, okay? Um, you're hoping to find a job in San Diego, right? You have a job in San Diego, you actually have a place you can live with your folks, right? For the next two years while you pay off your student debt, but you get a job offer for $70,000 a year, right? And so you have to start thinking about, well, what is it gonna cost for me to live in Fresno, right? If I live there, how much money is that gonna cost me to live there? Even though I'm getting paid more, right? If I can live, my parents said it's cool. I live in their granny flat, right, for the next two years. You see what I'm saying? Like, there is a way, guys, to quantify all of this. And so often we make decisions just based on how we feel. And if we go the extra step of getting a little advice or talking to two, three people about it, what do we feel? Oh, I like consulted three people about this. But I mean, sometimes that's not much better because they don't know what they're talking about either. Right, they're, they're kind of getting a vibe from you as you tell them and they go, I think they really want me to advise them yes. So yeah, great idea, right? Is that a good way to go about making a decision? No, not really. So you guys really want to list your alternatives. Even when you're pursuing jobs, this is a great way to go. List your, what are my options? What are my alternatives, right? Spend some time um, thinking about that and then spend some time um, evaluating your alternatives, right? So, okay, my alternatives, I really want to look closely because you list them, right? These are the different things I could do. Well, what would it cost me to live here? What would be the time frame there? How happy would I be here? Where would I be living there? What kind of people would I be around here, right? Based on those alternatives. Does this make sense? I mean, it's pretty basic stuff. But very infrequently do we take time to actually get out a piece of paper and systematically think through a lot of these things. Right, because we know how to make decisions. Right? We make decisions all the time, but when it comes to something like this, and you've got an offer, you want to go through this, right? Before you respond to the offer, you want to spend some time going through this. Established, what is your best alternative to this offer? What is your best alternative? Right? What is the best alternative? Because if you can't get what you want out of this offer, the offer that you get isn't the offer you want but your best alternative is, is way down here, then you might be willing to take a little less, right? Because your, your best alternative is not that great. Does that make sense? If your best alternative is pretty even, then you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna work hard to negotiate. Does that make sense, right? So you guys just need to get in the habit, we all do, 
of learning how to understand what is your BATNA, what is your best alternative to, to an agreement right here. Right? It's, it's, a great, it's a great tool. The last thing is, and this is getting a little bit in the weeds, right, for the idea of, of an offer, but um, it, it works well when you talk about maybe somebody selling a business, right? Or in my space, I'm negotiating with people all the time about buying a house or doing a rental. I'll give you an example. I'll have a client, uh, a client back when I owned a property management company, and they'll say, hey, Mike, we've got to rent this place out for 3000 bucks a month. And I go, okay, you've got to rent it out for 3000 bucks a month. All right, I understand. Um, it's going to take us about three weeks to get it rented out, right? So we're going to lose about a month, right, getting it rented out. Um, but but we'll get to work on it. We get to work on it. Somebody comes along and they say, hey, um, we like the place. We love the place. We found a few other options. We would rent this from you if we could get it for 2800 bucks a month. If we could get it for 2800 bucks a month, we'd sign up right now. We'd move in next week. Okay. And I go to my client and I go, look, I haven't been able to get $3,000 a month. I've been able to get $2,800 a month, right? They can move in next week, right? Otherwise, I don't really have any prospects. And I suspect it'll take me another three, maybe four weeks to rent this place out. You guys with me? Okay. So a lot of my clients, I'm, I'm not doing $2,800. I'm $3,000. Now, I, just, I told you I wanted 3,000 bucks. Why, why I hired you? You need to give me 3,000 bucks. I go, okay, but you understand the market slowed down a little bit. I get it. I don't care if it takes until the end of next month. I want 3,000 bucks. Okay. How much money how, well, are they going to lose, right, if they take $200 a month less over the course of the next year? What are they giving up? I don't have any math majors in here, right? But it's $2,400, right? So $2,400 they're going to lose out on if they go from $3,000 a month to $2,800 a month. So are they going to lose $2,400 more than $2,400 less than they wanted? Is that right? What if it takes me an extra month to rent the place out and I get $3,000? How much are they going to lose? They're going to lose $3,000, right? So listen, if they even if they take the $2,800 right now, they're in a better position than if they get $3,000 a month for now. Is that true? Right? Because they're going to miss out on a month's worth of rent. Right? So they're going to lose more than if they would just get this tenant in here and get them to start paying rent. Right? And we can raise the rent on them next year. Right? If we needed to. The fact is that if it takes me another month to rent it, am I likely to get $3,000 anyway? No. Now I'm coming to them saying, well, if somebody's willing to pay you $2,650, right? And they lost a three. So they need to know this. They need to understand what is their res reservation value. You can do the math and make it actually do the math and figure out, oh, if I do the math here, I know that if I take right now anything more than $2,750, I'll get, I'll be ahead. So that's, a, that's, they know the number. Do you know how many of my clients are willing to do this and do the math? Very like single digit percentage. They don't want, they don't care. They're stubborn. They have something in their mind. But and I try to do the math. They send them a worksheet, I send them Excel spreadsheets, all kind of stuff. Oh, wow. You know, or they'll fire me, right? <laughs> you go, well, okay. You know, um, in negotiating a salary, right, we need to understand what, when would we walk away? Would you possibly walk away from that offer? Well, you need to understand what it means to walk away. Where is that point that you walk away? And some of it's quantifiable. I mean, I used an example that's very easy to calculate the numbers, but some of it's not. You know, where you live or what the work culture is like or what are the opportunities for advancement, that sort of stuff. That, that could be, there's not necessarily a number that you can place on that. But is some of this making sense to you guys? Right? So, there is a way, guys, there's a system and even almost a formula that you can use to determine how to respond to an offer. It doesn't just have to be, well, I don't know, I'll just run it past my mom and see what she thinks, right? I mean, don't get me, moms are great, right? But if you're moving away from where she lives, she's going to tell you don't take the job, right? Or maybe vice versa. She's like, are you staying here? Then 
no, take the other job, right? I don't know. I don't know your relationship with your mom, but those aren't always the best ways. That, that's good input, right? But there's a way to do this. Is this is this a way that you guys have practiced thinking before? Right? There's a form of it that maybe we practice, but this gives you like kind of a format for it. Does that help? Any questions about some of this stuff or ideas? Yeah. I was going to say, like, before I came to university, like, I sort of did this about my options. And I sort of, like, thought, like, if I don't go to university, then, like, what are my other options? Yeah. And, like, like, if I do go to university, like, what, what would I have in four or five years compared to my other options in four or five years? 100%. And how much is it going to cost? Where am I going to be at the end of this thing? All that sort of stuff, right? We can employ this sort of decision making with anything. Once you do this, now you're in a position to negotiate, right? Because you know where your backstop is. You also, I, I listed on that, that last slide, maybe understanding your employer's BATNA. Could you try to figure that out? What's their best alternative, right? Do they have one? Knowing that can be useful so that when you come in to negotiate this counter offer, right, that you're gonna end up asking for 10% more than they offered you. You're gonna ask them for 10% more than they offered you, right? And that your vacation time starts accruing now, not after being employed for a year. Those are the two things that you're making a counter offer, right? And you know what you're willing to do, right? You know what it is that you're willing to do. If they come back and say, tell you what, we'll give you 5%, but we'll give you a 10% pay raise if you're still here a year from now, right? There could be this back and forth. And you need to have lines on your piece of paper that says, if I dip below this, I'm out, right? But if I get anything over this, I'm good. Does that make sense? So I want to encourage you guys to take the time to prepare because negotiating, right? Then the thing about, well, do I come back at 10% and do I poker face them or do I you know, am I friendly or how do I do? Those are all things you can, you can, we can watch YouTube videos and read tips on that. So we're blue in the face. But if you don't take the time, right, to understand where you are and what's your, what your alternatives are, then you're not going to be as successful as you could be. Does this make sense? Right. So I thought about this today, Dave. I want to hear from you in a second. Um, I could give you guys countless, literally, stories anecdotes, ideas, tips, tricks, ways to act, how to dress, how to approach, words to say, little ways to get people in positions where now you have the leverage, all that stuff. Listen, th th there's endless amounts of that. But if you don't prepare yourself, then all those tips and tricks, they just, they just don't matter very much. They don't matter very much. So that's why I decided to use our class time today to kind of go over this stuff, right? Because there's way better negotiators than me, right? But learning your style, we'll talk about that in just a second, and the, the how to persuade people, that's a whole other thing. But if you're not prepared, then, then, then you're not going to, you're not going to win. At least you're not going to achieve as much as you could. Dave, I'd love to hear from you. I was going to say the best uh, alternative may just be saying no, and you're back in the pool of trying to interview yeah. again. Yeah. But you might want to consider the macroeconomic environment you're in so for instance uh, when i graduated college in 1993 we're we're in a recession uh and there's a chance that that may happen for you guys when you graduate just because of what's going on but, yeah. you know, if you're in a tight labor envi environment where there's plenty of jobs and not enough people that's a different situation right right so it is it's knowing what else is out there and sometimes your best alternative is just to say no and get back into the mix and see what else you can find one, one additional point that I forgot. It, it may not be the best case, you know, if you only have the one offer to just take that offer and then and then you get another offer in two weeks and then you say, oh, bye bye, uh, I'm gonna go take this other one. Yeah, that doesn't reflect really well on you. Right. And in a small community, especially like a Timmy, it's a small community, you know, in motorcycles, that right. may come back to haunt you later. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be careful about that. So understanding what it could be the repercussions of the decisions that you make or the, the approaches that you make. So um, I'm grateful for you guys to be paying attention to this stuff. I, I, again, I think it can be really useful to you, but it takes some some time. Oh, so like, on that note, like sometimes the people who might be looking to hire you or maybe people who you had a connection with beforehand, whether that be like your family or friends, 
And like sometimes it's like that. I don't know like what the situation is like here in the US. I understand it's different, but like you know, Saturday is like a very touchy topic. And so yeah. then, like having a discussion with someone who you know outside of the office, like how do you sort of approach that? Because you sort of like don't want to be rude because you're giving you the opportunity. So that's a fantastic question. And and my first response to that is that this becomes even more critical. It becomes even more critical because when it's subjective and feelings and, oh, I know this person and they're giving me an opportunity and all this sort of stuff, you're kind of just swimming around and like, well, I know. you know, you're making decisions that aren't really based on a quantitative, you know, thoughtful analysis. And I'll tell you what, most people are going to be pretty impressed if this shines through, right? In your counter offer or in your negotiating, it's like, well, I've really thought about my options here. And these are the things I'm planning to achieve. It's the reason I went to college. And it's the reason I'm in this career path. And this just doesn't quite meet my needs. It doesn't get me to where I'm trying to go. Generally speaking, that that's impressive. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it, it's kind of, it's not so subjective. Does that make sense? It's more like, hey, I have a plan. I'm going somewhere. I've been working really hard to get there, right? I've done an analysis. And this is where I'm coming after that analysis, right? That takes some of the feeling out of it, right? And that might even have a family member or a friend or somebody that's trying to be helpful say, oh, well, I was trying to do you a favor, but you actually have, you know where you want to go. And I'm just, we're not on the same page. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it removes like, well, I don't like you. And well, you're ingrateful, all this sort of stuff. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Having like, to back, to back, forward, back onto, yeah. instead of pushing for something. Yeah. When you always want to give a reason, and when your reason is some logic and that and thoughtfulness, sometimes that goes through. Now that, that goes to my my next slide. Here's some persuasion approaches, guys. Um, I wouldn't say that that any of these are uh, always universally useful, but again, I, I've I've got this on the sheet that you can download through Canvas. But some people are. You want to think through this. What evidence or logic can I present such that they will agree with me? That I need to get paid more or that I'm worth more. Or And if you can't find a real logical argument for that, maybe you don't have a good argument for that, right? If Glassdoor and everybody else says that you should get paid X and they're offering you X, you may not have a logical argument for making more, right? Does that, does that make sense? Um, but not all situations are, are based on logic. You want to most are. I mean, I would say most there's going to be a component of that, but you want to know the negotiation style of the of the space and place and person you're working with. Does this make sense? So if they're very logical, if they just do things by the book, like if you try to get a job here at the university, guess what? Probably few people on this campus make decisions about who gets paid what. It's already in the Cal State University system, right? This big, you guys following me? It's this big system where decisions have already been made and you get a job and this is what you get paid. And that's it. There really isn't a negotiation. Right? Sometimes that's the way it works. Other times it's different. You just need to know what you're stepping into. What do we have in common? Right? If you really are trying to win somebody over, what you have in common can a lot of times be helpful. Just understanding how that creates some affinity with people. Right? Do you like, we usually gravitate to people that we have something in common for with. Right? I'm more likely to be persuaded by somebody as they start to demonstrate how we know the same people or from the same places or this sorts of stuff. Right, A normal thing. How is your offer or your counter offer exceptional? Right, How might it be different than, than other people that they're interviewing? What's different about you? We talked about this a little bit earlier. But leveraging that, using that as, as a way to persuade somebody to get what it is that you need or what you want. Let's say you're in a company and you're trying to get a raise at a company you're already in or a place you've already been working for. Uh, what do you think would be common, right? Somebody's been working at a place for three years, right? They've moved from tier one to tier two, but everybody else that got hired around the same time as them is like in tier three and tier four, right? With the benefits and salaries that that comes with. And they would like to get a raise and they go to their boss. What are the things that they're saying to their boss? Typically, not you. I would say a typical person like that doesn't have this education, that doesn't have this thoughtfulness, that just 
what what would they bring to their to their boss, maybe their manager? Like, the others are being paid this. I should be paid. This. Okay. Yeah. So and so is getting paid that. Why am I am I not getting paid that? Okay. Yeah. What are some other things that somebody like this might be bring to their manager? And this is not like a a high level job, right? This is like a a basic, just above minimum wage type of job. What typically is a the mentality there when that person goes to their manager and wants to get paid more? What are the other reasons that they might use or that you might hear? How long they've worked there? Oh, yeah, totally. I've worked here longer than this person. I've worked here for this long. Totally. Okay. Hear that all the time, right? What are others that might come to mind? Anything else? I mean, I think this would be smart to do, but give examples of what they've done at the company. Okay. Totally. Here's how I've benefited the company. Yeah, that, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Going off what she said, like taking up other people's like slots, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And and why are they getting paid more? I'm doing this and that and the other. Okay. So demonstrating your value. Um, let me just say what not to do. Right. What you need, even though we're talking about budget and what your minimum salary and all that stuff is, but telling somebody. Um, boy, I just got married. I just had a kid. Um, I just got in a car wreck. Uh, I just bought a new this or that. No, none of that, guys. Don't ever bring up your personal kind of financial situation in 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 that sort of way. Does that make sense? Because if I own a big company and I have to keep making a profit in order to keep all these people employed for me to even have the company, because I own a company not just to own a company, I own a company to make some profit, right? And if you're asking me to take less profit because you crashed your car, well, why would I do that, right? I mean, even if I'm a benevolent, nice person, I can't afford to do that, right? I can't afford to do that every time somebody has a mishap or a mistake. Does that make sense? Not because I'm a mean, grouchy, you know, capitalist, right? It's because that's what it takes to keep this company running. Does that make sense? And so those aren't things. And even when I've worked here a long time, even that, well, I've worked here a long time. Okay, haven't I paid you for a long time? Right? I've never been late. Oh, neither have I when you get your paychecks. Right? <laughs> These aren't valid arguments. Does that make sense? Like if I rolled up to McDonald's and they said, hey, Big Macs are seven bucks now. Seven bucks? I came through the other day, it was like 250. Yeah, but we've been serving you these burgers for 30 years now. We've decided that we're going to raise the price because we've been doing it for a long time. Does that make sense? That's what it says, right? It's about market value, right? So, what value are you bringing, right? What value are you bringing that might allow you to ask for that raise? Now, it's in a raise situation, but we've got to think about some of that stuff. What are we doing that's exceptional, right? What what value are we bringing um, that might be different or that might be unexpected or that they're not realizing? as we get into this counteroffer situation. What are their self-interests, right? Why is it in their best interest to consider your offer? This just might be something we're thinking about. How could this benefit them? Listen, it, you know, I just think that this is gonna be amazing for you, you know, to have me on board because I'm going to do this, that, and the other, right? Uh, understanding how long they've had that job posting up. They need to get somebody in there to start solving these problems now. These are good things to be aware of. What can you exchange for similar equal value, either now or over time? Like I said, hey, we need you to work Saturdays. Well, what if I worked one Saturday a month? You know, could, could we work this out? Could I work one Saturday a month and I'm willing to work those Mondays that you were gonna give me off, right? Like this kind of thing, right? There's a, there, what, what can you exchange in that offer? And then compare and contrast. So really understanding how to set your counter offer in a better light, you know? Um, hey, look, imagine hiring somebody that has no familiarity with your company. I've been a fan of your company for 10 years, right? You might have a problem with them, I'm here. You're not gonna have that problem with me, just comparing and contrasting. So we buzzed through this stuff, we're getting out of time for today, but Executing is is when it becomes important. Dave, you got some input? Just one thing in the exchange area. Often, uh, many times in a, in a company, the offer is not just salary. It's salary, bonus, uh, stock options, some combination of all of those. And so you, you've got not just the salary piece. Right. You have multiple things to negotiate on. Exactly. Exactly. So knowing what that is, knowing where you're at. 
this is what's going to help you to negotiate that best that best offer. Again, you're surrounded by people that really want to see you succeed and 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 get the maximum that you can. Um, so take advantage of those, whether it's the career center, uh, people in your cohort like this, coaches, instructors, um, we are looking forward to helping you get those job offers and then turn them into the best that, that you can. So hope this is helpful today. Uh, we'll see you on Zoom next week. Thanks, everybody.